In this issue of Wide World of Flying, you'll get a left seat checkout in the turbocharged, intercooled Mooney 252. You'll see a preview of the new Argus 5000 moving map display and a new satellite transmitted weather service from Pan Am. You'll visit Oshkosh for an inside view of how ATC handles traffic at the world's biggest aviation event. And you'll begin the first of a two-part in-depth series on stepping up to a Learjet. In our bonus buyer's guide at the end of this tape, North Star Avionics gives you an introduction to the high-tech world of Loran Sea Navigation. Piper's new owner, M. Stewart Millar, shares his thoughts on the future of Piper aircraft under his leadership. And John and Martha King give you VFR and IFR tips to make your flying more enjoyable. All this and more in this issue of ABC's Wide World of Flying. Welcome to this video edition of ABC's Why World of Flying. As you can tell from our opening highlights, we'll cover a wide range of subject material. It's all designed to be interesting and informative to those whose hobby or business touches general aviation. You know, a lot has been happening lately that affects our flying. While my aircraft is based in the New York metropolitan area, I've watched with interest the emergency action announced by the FAA in August with the Los Angeles TCA. Now, the FAA has announced similar actions will be taken in all major cities. The week after the changes were announced, I spent two days in Southern California with the leaders of AOPA. Now, we met with general aviation pilots, airport operators, airline captains, controllers, and members of the FAA. Now, interestingly, all expressed unanimous opposition to the hastily announced Los Angeles changes. Even the FAA management people involved in controlling that Southern California airspace read about the changes in the press rather than being asked to help formulate a plan. Now, the FAA timing of the announcement, just days before the first anniversary of the Cerritos Midair, seemed more important than the impact that the plan would have on all concerned commercial air carriers, general aviation pilots, controllers, and most important, the general public. Those of us who fly in high traffic areas must comply with increasing airspace regulations, and we must be prepared to equip our planes with mode C transponders. Those who create the rules for these same areas must do so with careful thought for the entire aviation community, and not let other considerations prompt knee-jerk reactions. But right now, your VCR is the only special equipment you need to enjoy ABC's Wide World of Flying. The 252 stands for a 252 mile per hour top speed. The TSE means Turbo Special Edition. And the Mooney out front means this is the latest in the succession of Al Mooney's remarkable aerodynamic efficiency experts. 
Hi, we're here at Performance Aircraft of Hayward, California, the largest Mooney dealership in the world, to explore the magic of the modern Mooney. This new 252 represents the technological culmination of a long line of Mooneys that began in 1952 with a single-seat Mooney Might. More recently, at least since 1979, the Mooney 231 has ruled Mooney's roost. While the 231 is an excellent airplane, the 252 makes improvements in several important areas. First, the 252's air research turbocharger is larger and has greater capacity than the 231, giving the new model a much higher critical altitude. But the big change on the 252 is the addition of intercooling. We'll hear more about that later in the show from Mooney's Director of Engineering, Rocky Peters. Mooney also made a few aerodynamic changes in the transition from 231 to 252. The older airplane featured a fairing at the wing root leading edge, but the new one, strangely, has no fairing. Induction air is sucked in through an NACA scoop mounted on the cowling's right side, and under the wing, Mooney has added inboard gear doors to fully enclose the wheels. Finally, the window line is changed to a more pressurized look. Inside the cabin surrounded by those windows, the Mooney is definitely a nice place to visit, if not as tall as some other airplanes. Cabin height is only 44 inches, but there's 42 and a half inches of elbow room in the front seat, compared to 42 inches of space in the F-33 Bonanza. And the seats themselves are plush and comfortable. The center console that encloses the nose wheel in the up position also houses the power, cowl, and wing flap controls. However, it limits legroom to either side in the front seat. Like virtually all Moonies before it, the 252's baggage compartment loads through a high door that's actually cut into the cabin roof. You do have to lift all baggage fairly high to get it into the airplane, but the compartment is large and you can stuff up to 120 pounds inside. But before we actually fly the 252, Let's take a quick walk through the Mooney factory in the hill country of Kerrville, Texas to see how they build the airplane. In 1986, the company delivered a total of 141 model 201s, 205s, and 252s worth about $19 million. All of them built here at Kerrville, Texas, the Mooney way, which means, well, different. For instance, in the wing shop, Mooney builds its wings with a single 36-foot spar carry-through. It runs all the way from tip to tip. This is in contrast to other manufacturers that simply bolt the wings onto the fuselage. Here in the wing fuselage join area, the wings are ready to be mated to the fuselage and the airplane ready to come off its dolly and onto its own main gear. When the basic fuselage is complete, it's maneuvered into position above the spar carry-through lowered onto the wing structure and bolted into place. The completed airplane is then painted on a revolving pedestal in Mooney's paint shop. When we developed the 252, we listened to our customers. Instead of developing a product and then forcing it upon the marketplace, we listened to our previous 231 owners. Certain things they liked and didn't like about their product is how we got a list of things to use to develop the 252. Such things as uh, electric cow flaps, the light colored instrument panel, center armrest for the front and rear seat passengers, uh, better engine cooling, tuned induction system, intercooler. All of these things came about because our customers asked us for those changes and we gave them to them in the 252. It was obvious in the state of the market of the general aviation industry that something drastically new had to be offered to the buying public. Why would you buy a brand new airplane 
when you could buy a used, used airplane, good airplane, uh, at significantly reduced prices. This spawned a very intense and a very concentrated R&D effort to develop what we now know as the 252. The heart of the 252, of course, is the power plant. And to maintain the performance of the aircraft, we installed an intercooler into the induction system. What the intercooler basically does is it takes the hot compressed air from the turbocharger uh, and cools it down to where the engine can ingest a cooler fuel-air mixture ratio. This provides greater power for the engine. Cylinder heads on the 231 were always a little bit hotter than what we really wanted them to be. Uh, it was primarily done for performance purposes. So here engineering was challenged to get best cooling and still maintain the performance of the power plant installation. So what we ended up doing is, is increasing our inlet areas about 50 percent, a very large increase in inlet areas for the cooling of the engine. We balanced this with proper exit sizing. We, cha we changed the cow flaps on the airplane to a centrally located, constantly and infinitely variable cow flap arrangement, which is electrically driven. The other aspect of the 231 was it had very large openings for the main landing gear to go up into. Uh, we had outboard and middle doors on it, but we didn't have anything to cover up the wheel. So we incorporated a mechanical uh, operated inboard sequencing landing gear door system. The gear doors uh, on the inboard side are up when the gear is down. They cycle open when the gear retracts. When the gear is fully in the well, the doors close up again. Um, Mooney pilots are very proud of the performance of their aircraft, and we knew we had to make it as good and better than anything else in the market. But rather than just tell you about the 252, let's take a flight in this newest Mooney to see what the airplane can really do. Because they sit low, Moonies are fairly stable little airplanes on the taxiway. Though the rubber donut suspension system does cause a certain hobby horse tendency on rough asphalt, and the outboard wheel doors are close to the ground, making unpaved strips chancy operations. One nice operational change is the 252's automatic turbo controller that lets you push the throttle to the wall without busting the limit of 36 inches of manifold pressure. Acceleration with a normal load isn't spectacular, but the airplane can easily use 2,000 foot strips with plenty of margin. Gear and flaps come up smoothly and with minimum pitch change. But the new Mooney is perhaps best known as the fastest unpressurized production single engine airplane in the world. Beachless, the B36TC Bonanza's top speed is 213 knots, while the 252 does about 219 knots flat out. Like all Moonies before it, this 252 achieves its performance on minimum power, specifically about 210 horsepower to realize cruise speeds well in excess of 200 knots. Right now, as you can see in the background, we're cruising along about 1,500 feet above the northern California coast. But we're about to launch for a climb to 17,500, and then right on up to the Moonies' maximum operating altitude, 28,000 feet. Today we're flying a little light, 200 pounds under gross, and that may be the reason we're waxing the book figure of 1,080 feet per minute. You can see our climb rate is settled on 1,300 feet per minute here at our current altitude of 8,000 feet. We're developing full power now at 2,700 RPM, yet the noise level inside this 252 is much quieter than in its predecessor, the 231. In fact, the decibel count is uh, about one dB lower than either the Bonanza or the Cessna 210, both considered fairly quiet airplanes. With this Continental engine out front, we can maintain full power to 24,000 feet and 78.6% cruise power all the way up to the Mooney's maximum operating altitude of 28,000 feet. We've reached 12,500 now, so it's time to plug into the Mooney's oxygen system. Notice our VSI reading as we pass 12,500 feet. Still about 1,200 feet per minute. 
Unlike some general aviation oxygen systems, Mooney's huge bottle allows four people to remain at tall altitudes for a reasonable period of time. The bottle holds about 117 cubic feet of oxygen, and when charged to 1,750 pounds pressure, it can keep four people breathing easily at 20,000 feet for five and a half hours. As you can see, we've leveled at 17,500 feet and joined up with the Mooney 231. Because both airplanes use essentially the same engine, they cruise at about the same speed at medium altitudes. Right now, according to the 252's flight manual, we should be seeing about 190 knots. But because we're light and also benefiting from some tailwinds, we're getting nearly 200. Down here, both airplanes are pulling approximately the same power. But as we climb higher, the 231's power will begin to drop off, while the 252 just keeps on trucking. Critical altitude on the 231 is 15,000 feet, but on the 252 it's 24,000 feet, the same as the 231's max operating altitude. Out of 25,000 feet, we're still showing about 700 feet per minute on the VSI, headed for the 252's maximum operating altitude of 28,000 feet. Maximum operating altitude, incidentally, isn't the same as service ceiling. An airplane's service ceiling is a performance parameter. It's typically applied to normally aspirated models to define the height at which they can still climb at 100 feet per minute. Maximum operating altitude, on the other hand, is a systems limitation. And it refers to the highest level where a given aircraft system will function normally in the low temperature and pressure environment at those altitudes. Okay, here we are coming up on flight level 270, the highest altitude ATC will give us today. So we'll just close the cow flaps, punch the altitude hold, and let the airplane accelerate on out to its best cruise speed. We're really up in the Mooney's element now. At 78.6% power, we're showing 135 knots indicated for about 216 knots true. Fortunately, we have the wind behind us, providing a good 40 knots more speed. As you can see on the KNS-80 DME readout, we're making 260 knots over the ground. Keep in mind, too, that we're running 260 knots on only about 13 gallons per hour. In automotive terms, that means we're making about 20 miles per gallon, the same as your average Mercedes at about four times street legal speeds. The outside air temperature up here at 27,000 feet is minus 20 degrees centigrade. You might think that would be adequate to keep any engine cool. But in fact, our inner cooler, which is essentially an air radiator, makes all the difference at this height. Without it, our Continental probably would be overheating badly. Anytime you compress air as with a turbo, you heat it up. The inner cooler brings that temperature back down after it exits the turbo, but before introducing it to the cylinders for combustion. The temperature of the outside air is a secondary consideration to its density at these heights. Air is just too thin to provide much cooling up here. On descent, you have the opposite problem, especially in a clean design such as a Mooney. Quick letdowns can shock cool the engine unless you have the advantage of speed brakes. The Bridgework style speed brakes can be deployed at any speed right on up to redline and allow you to leave the power up to keep the engine warm during letdowns. We're descending out of flight level 270 for a more breathable altitude, and we're coming downhill at about 1,200 feet per minute. Yet our airspeed is steady at 175 knots, and the power is still at cruise. You don't have to climb to five mile high altitudes to realize quick cruise in the 252. If you prefer not to suck on oxygen, you can level at medium heights and still truck along at very respectable speeds. Down here at 12,500 feet, we've set up max cruise, and we're still seeing 184 knots on only 12.8 gallons per hour. This Mooney is the cleanest one yet. As you can see, the gear is now fully enclosed, most antennas are buried, and everything fits flush. In short, the only current production airplane more efficient than the 252 is Mooney's own normally aspirated 205. The 252's handling isn't quick, but it's very light. The airplane is a delight to fly in virtually all modes.
though long climbs are something of a pain because the Mooney doesn't have rudder trim. The speed brakes come in handy again in the pattern to help regulate approach speeds. Gear extension results in little pitch change, though the last 10 degrees of flaps do generate a nose down pitching moment. Holding the airspeed at 70 to 75 knots, the 252's wing still retains plenty of lift for flare, and it's easy to squeak the wheels on every time. Well, almost anyway. What's even more fun, though, is the short field effort. With 65 knots and any significant wind, it's easy to stop a 252 in a ridiculously short distance. In this case, about 600 feet. The Mooney 252 offers a truly impressive combination of high performance with low fuel burn. The biggest problem is the 525 pound payload. Lack of rudder trim also is an inconvenience on an airplane designed to cruise in the flight levels. There's no certification for known icing, a definite consideration when you need to climb on top. Still, the 252 is a lot of airplane for the money. It lets pilots top the weather with an 1100 nautical mile range at 55% power. For the man willing to forego the Malibu's pressurization, icing certification, and six seats, but save $300,000 in the process, this latest thoroughbred Mooney offers more than enough for less than too much. On an ILS approach, which code signal should you observe on the marker beacon lights as you pass over the outer marker? Alternate dots and dashes, a series of dots, or a series of dashes? The correct answer is a series of dashes. Alternate dots and dashes are at the middle marker, and a series of dots are at the inner marker. When a valve in your engine begins to stick, the engine will probably run rough on the first start of the day. The roughness usually goes away in less than a minute, and the engine will smooth out and apparently run just fine. This is a symptom that mechanics call morning sickness, and it's serious enough to be a good reason to abort a takeoff. Just because the engine is running smoothly doesn't mean the problem has gone away or won't get worse. Let me show you an example of what morning sickness sounds like on this Cherokee 140. After your normal pre-start checklist and priming are complete, you turn the engine over, just like any other morning. Clear? And this is what it sounds like once it's running. This engine is actually missing on one of its cylinders. The roughness is pretty obvious in this four-cylinder engine and won't be as pronounced in a six-cylinder engine. But notice what happens next. After as little as 20 seconds, the engine may smooth out, like this one did. The dangerous pitfall here is that you might think the mixture was too rich. Maybe you overprimed it a bit. Or maybe there was a bit of moisture in a magneto. But since the engine smoothed out, you assume everything's okay now. This could be a fatal assumption. The next thing that could happen is a total seizure of a valve under takeoff power. Imagine just lifting off or climbing out and losing a cylinder. If your airplane experiences engine roughness that just seems to cure itself, don't take a chance. Abort the trip and get the valves checked by a certified A&E mechanic. I can't remember a device that's had such an impact on the cockpit of a single or light twin as Loran C. Once a Loran has calculated your aircraft position in latitude and longitude, it can perform amazing microcomputer calculations to determine ground speed, track, bearing, distance to the nearest airport, and a host of other things. What next, you might ask? 
Well, we're at Eventide Incorporated, a small company located near Teterboro Airport in New Jersey. They've just introduced a product indicative of the technology for the future. It's the Argus 5000 Moving Map Display. Now, this device could occupy a full-length video feature on Wide World of Flying. But Richard Factor, the company president, has invited us into the factory for a brief first glance at this exciting product. I was a brand new pilot. I had just gotten my license. And uh, having the usual experiences with uh, navigation, with all those instruments and dials, I said, wouldn't it be a lot nicer if we simply had a map uh, showing exactly where in relation to the aircraft uh, the airports uh, and the nav aids and everything are? Uh, and as a result, we started developing a product which turned into the Argus. The Argus 5000 takes the Loran C position data from those units with an RS-232 output and heading information from a properly equipped DG and presents it all on a three-inch screen in relationship to airports, nav aids, and special use airspace. The maps and data come from a field upgradable database contained in a memory board in the Argus 5000. Now, Richard has one of the units installed in his Subaru station wagon, driven by an RNAV R15 Loran. Plus, his fully equipped Cessna 172 contains a moving map driven off an Apollo 612. I rode in both the car and airplane to watch the units perform in action. To best show you close-ups of the display, however, we decided a computer-driven Loran signal at the factory would eliminate all camera jiggle and best demonstrate the unit. Even in this manner, the strobe effect on the display is caused by our video camera and is not seen this way by the pilot. Richard has programmed a 13 nautical mile trip from Lincoln Park, N07, to Teterboro for our simulation. Those of you with still frame capability on your VCR will find it very useful to pick out details. In the departure mode, two mile range, indicated by the letters DEP slash two in the lower right corner, we can see the single north-south runway at Lincoln Park. As the aircraft departs runway 19, let's look at the information provided. The upper left display shows a 130 degree bearing to Teterboro, the destination waypoint set into your Loran. Underneath the bearing is the distance remaining to Teterboro. In the middle of the upper screen is the track of the aircraft across the ground, in this case, 190 degrees. The ground speed and arrival time are shown in the upper right-hand corner. The lower left contains the destination waypoint identifier, TEB, which you set in your Loran, and below that, the highest obstruction in the range selected. Now, the middle of the lower screen has an electronic CDI needle. Changing to the four-mile range shows another airport, CDW, Caldwell, coming up at 11 o'clock. The best feature to me was the depiction of TCA rings with altitudes in relationship to the airplane. This could prove to be the most valuable feature, particularly when Eventide adds all special use airspace to their database. Note the small rings in the upper right and lower left corners with numbers identifying the floor and ceiling limits of the New York TCA. En route, the aircraft symbol is in the lower portion of the screen with plenty of room to display the 20 to 240 nautical mile range in front. We're in a pretty congested area of New York airspace on the 20 mile range. When I criticized the busy display in this mode, Richard deselected the terminal vortex, NDBs, fan markers, and the TCA rings. The pilot determines what he wants to show, including IFR airports or minimum runway length airports. In arrival mode, the display is always north up, with the symbolic aircraft maneuvering toward a centered airport or nav aid. Now, we clearly saw ourselves on the downwind leg to runway one at Teterboro on the display. The turn to base and final were all accurately depicted, without much lag time at all. Now, you'll rarely touch your Loran C receiver once you've selected the destination waypoint, making it possible to buy one of the less expensive Lorans. The Argus 5000 database contains a duplication of most of the information in the fanciest of Lorans. All of this pioneering is not without some criticism, however. There were bugs 
in both the car and airplane units that I saw demonstrated relating to information in the very limited areas that we were operating. Now, Eventide indicates that they are working to eliminate and document these bugs so that the first deliveries can be made. I also found the alphanumerics on the map just a little too small, even with the unit ideally situated right in front of the pilot. And since you're going to have to have a map or a chart on your lap, it will be up to you to decide whether the added graphic presentation of the Argus 5000 is worthwhile. You can't fault Eventide's initiative for building a unit for today's installed marketplace of over 35,000 aviational rands. And you certainly can't fault their attractive price of under $4,000. Recently, a story on the Porsche Mooney engine ran on the ABC television network Sunday Business Program. We thought wide world of flying subscribers who missed that story might enjoy a replay. When the word Porsche is mentioned, you think of three things, sports car, price, and engine. Now, as ABC correspondent Steve Shepard reports, the German car maker is hoping its high-performance engineering will take off in a new project. The plane is a Mooney 231, a popular American-made machine with a lot of performance. But this Mooney is like no other ever made, because it's powered by a Porsche engine. Porsche took the engine that drives its renowned 911 sports car and adapted it for flying. Before it ever got airborne, the engine was already one of the most tried and true high-performance propulsion systems ever built. We have built now about 250,000 engines for cars and have now with this engine about 20,000 hours on the test bench and about 4,000 hours in the air. While this is Porsche's first venture in airplane engines since before World War II, Porsche is not new to the business. Porsche engines were powering airplanes as far back as 1909. In designing its new power plant, Porsche came up with a concept that may revolutionize flying. In most piston engine airplanes, the pilot must operate three engine levers. One to control power, a second to control fuel-air mixture, and a third to set the pitch of the propeller blade. But in the new Porsche engine, all three controls are combined into one. Push the lever forward, you increase power. Pull it back, you slow down. It greatly simplifies flying. The engine is uh, running itself, everything is controlled automatic. People is not sitting in the cockpit to control the engine. He is in the cockpit uh, to look for other aircraft to make his navigation. It's, for my opinion, a big improvement in flight safety. While airplane sales are down in both the U.S. and Europe, Porsche thinks its revolutionary new engine will be a moneymaker anyway. The company already has agreements with at least one European manufacturer to supply all its new engines, and there is rumored to be serious interest from a major American plane builder. Porsche succeeded in the automobile business by offering high performance and innovative engineering. It hopes to use those same two qualities to sell a lot of airplane engines. Steve Shepard, ABC News, Frankfurt, West Germany. So the next time one of your friends tells you his Porsche can really fly, you might just believe him. En route flight advisory service, Flight Watch, is available on 122.0, 122.2, or 123.6. The answer is 122.0, and pilot reports are always welcome. Tall cornfields, picturesque farms. This is the heart of America. For one weekend in the middle of summer each year, a small town in Wisconsin becomes the location of the busiest airport in the world. This is Oshkosh, one of the most remarkable events in aviation today. Last year we 
exceeded 65,000 operations for the entire convention, and our busiest day was 12,300, which exceeds the normal operation of O'Hare, which is 3,150. So we're well above the world's busiest airport for the convention. We're here in the tower to bring you a unique view of Oshkosh, a view that most pilots never get a chance to see. This is the behind-the-scenes story of air traffic control here at Oshkosh. But the story doesn't begin here in the control tower at Whitman Field. It starts some five and a half miles away at a little town called Fisk. The Cessna coming up over Fisk, following the moon. He started right turn. Air traffic control at Oshkosh is based on the understanding and use of a special VFR arrival procedure, a procedure that makes traffic control here even possible. Miles outside Fisk right now. Stay in line, single file up the tracks, 1,800 feet, 110 mile an hour. We'll give you a sequence when you're directly over Fisk. Before we had the Fisk operation, all the airplanes were coming in and right downwinds for runway 27 over the gravel pit. The old time Oshkosh people will tell you about the gravel pit, which was located just on the northwest side of the airport. But the problem was that they'd be arriving at the gravel pit from 100 different directions, on top of each other, next to each other, every which way. So they decided they had to have some way to segregate the airplanes, try to get them single file before they got to the airport. So what they've come up with is what we call the Fisk arrival procedure. And this is what the graphic notice is printed every year. And what it consists of is there's a railroad track that runs from Oshkosh Airport southwestbound. Real easy to follow. Six miles out on the railroad track, there's a little town called Fisk, which is where we're standing. 17 miles out on the railroad track, there's a town called Ripon. The procedure will be everybody flies to Ripon. No matter where you're coming from, you fly to Ripon. If you come from the east, too bad, you fly around the Oshkosh area, get yourself to Ripon. Once you get to Ripon, you start looking for lots of airplanes. You get in line behind somebody else, single file, 1,800 feet, 100 miles an hour. If you cannot maintain 100 miles an hour, then 2,300 feet, 150. But we like to get everybody we can in one line. What we're aiming for here is to get everybody at the airport to the tower in a single file line so they can take them right into the runway without having to do a lot of sequencing once they're on the tower frequency. They fly over Fisk, we look up and try to figure out who they are by color, by type. Sometimes we have to get real specific. We can say the Cessna 120 with the D windows, the Cessna 140 with the wheel extenders, whatever we can use to differentiate one from the other. Give them instructions, trying to get them single file. Once we get them here, we've got a decision to make as to what runway to put them on. Right now we're operating in two runways, runway 27 and runway 36. What we're trying to do to help out the ground congestion problem at the airport is put the airplanes that are going to park near the airshow area on 36 because they can turn off and go right in there. So what we're trying to do is take experimentals, home builds, warbirds, that kind of thing, put them all on runway 36. So from here, Larry will give them a right turn for a left base entry to runway 36, and the traffic going to 27 will stay on those railroad tracks which go just north of the airport. Then they'll enter a right down one for runway 27 north of the airport. We give one tower frequency for 27, a different tower frequency for 36. One thing you may hear is Larry's given 36 right and 36 left. Anybody has an Oshkosh chart won't find a 36 right on it or a 36 left. There's only one. What we've done is during the air show, we designate the parallel taxiway as 36 right. We can actually land three at a time because we can land 36 left, 36 right, and there's a side area in between that is also designated a runway. So on runway 36, we can put in lots of airplanes. Here, when the airport gets too congested, we get a phone call. We've got a phone link up direct to the tower. We get a phone call. They tell us to shut off Fisk. All we do is start making a blind broadcast. Number one, we tell anybody that hasn't reached the Ripon, city of Ripon, do not go there. It's going to be real busy there. You don't want to be there. Pick a spot on the ground, make left turns over your spot on the ground, stay away from Ripon. We tell people that if you're at Ripon, fine, circle left turns at Ripon, watch for lots of other traffic. The big problem, of course, is the airplanes like you can see out here, which are all lined up toward the airport now. They're committed past Ripon. They're coming up on us at Fisk. What we do then is we pick the lead airplane. We tell them, you are the leader. We're playing follow the leader now. You're the leader. What you're going to do is when I tell you to, you start a left turn, and Rush Lake lies just to the west of us. You start a left turn. You get on the lake shore of Rush Lake. You fly a left-hand pattern just along the lake shore. Everybody behind, single file. You just stay in line. Everybody goes behind. We keep that going. When the tower tells us we can start again, we find a last airplane for that line. We get his number, we can really identify him. Meanwhile, nobody else should be coming beyond Ripon. The only people we should be talking to between Ripon and Fisk are those that were already committed. They all start the left turn around. There's the phone. We're probably going to be shut off right now. As they start the left turn around, they rejoin the railroad tracks again on the way back. We tell that number one airplane, OK, we're going in now. Keep him going. Give him the runway that we wanted to take him to. Switch him to the tower, and away we go. We have to empty out that Rush Lake holding pattern first, then empty out Ripon 
Once we've got Ripon emptied out, we tell everybody, hold on away from Ripon, okay, go to Ripon now. It just astounds me that pilots will um, allow themselves to run low on fuel and they're ashamed or afraid to tell anybody about it. And we've seen it happen a couple times a year. I, I guess I'm aware of a couple situations a year where it sounds like a routine flight. The pilot has passed a number of airports en route that he could have landed at. He gets uh, five to eight miles away from the airport and then uh, out of the clear blue he says, I'm out of gas, I'm not going to make it. And at that stage of the game, when that occurs, there's not much that we can do for the guy except offer alternate uh, possible landing sites and get out rescue equipment. Cherokee, I don't want you to follow him. Experimental, go straight ahead, follow a tail dragger. Straight ahead. If you see him, rock your wings. Okay, real good. Straight ahead, runway 9, monitor the tower 18.5. The problem we've just ran into now is normally we like a runway 27 operation. We get a west wind, the traffic comes in from the southwest, and there's a right downwind for runway 27. We have a downwind, we have a base, we have a final. We have a lot of time at the tower to sort things out. What we've just had now is a wind shift to the east. We got a wind of 120 at 10, which has necessitated a change to our runway 9 operation. We just lost the luxury of the downwind to sort traffic out. Now the traffic is coming from here at Fisk directly onto an angling base lake to final on runway 9. So this job becomes much more critical. The way the airplanes leave here is the way they're going to arrive at the runway. There's not going to be any time for the tower to sort them out. Essentially, the traffic begins to build on Thursday morning. It has always traditionally begun to build the day before the show actually starts. In the old days, when the show started on Saturday, traffic would build up on Friday, and we had to start staffing these facilities a day early. Then the EA moved the air show to a start on Friday. Our traffic started hitting on Thursday. So here we are on Thursday morning, and we've had a steady stream all morning. Uh, I'm told there's about 6,000 airplanes already on the airport. If this goes according to the last couple of years, by tomorrow at about noon, we'll have the airport saturated. Probably the most common problem that we've run into is that the pilots are so used to a tower operation having to talk back to us. And we don't want them to talk back to us. We want to control the frequency. We don't need a verbal response. What we'll usually use is give me a wing rack. We'll give you instructions, so follow the bonanza hen to your right. If you see them, rock your wings. We'll see those wings go up and down. That's all we need to know, and away you go. Thank we you just can keep right on going to the next airplane. Pilots are so attuned to having to talk back to us and to acknowledge from us verbally that uh, they tend to answer even though we don't want them to. You can come in dash crash on these procedures and leave without ever talking on the radio. We have to control the frequency. There's so much talking to be done. We have to control the frequency, and we just don't have time to wait for acknowledgement. So right down from way 27, keep your down one in tight. Close to 172, rock your wings. These are the VFR arrival procedures that we're using here at Fisk. An IFR procedure requires a reservation. A lot of times reservations get hard to come by. Normally the reservations are taken by corporate jets, that kind of thing. But occasionally you get the Learjet driver, the Cessna Citation driver, Hawker or Sidley driver that can't get an IFR reservation. Then we get them in the VFR pattern. And nothing like seeing a bunch of home builds. A couple Cessna 120, Cessna 195, and on top of the whole mess, here's a Learjet with everything hanging out, doing 150 knots, 2,300 feet, fitting in the VFR pattern like everybody else. So the main thing is to read the procedures, know what you're going to do before you get here, listen to the instructions as you go by, and then switch over to tower frequency and listen on that. But the key thing is, don't talk. We don't need you to talk, we need you to listen, then we need you to rock your wings to show you heard us, and just go in your happy way and have a good Ashkash. That's what Oshkosh is about, having a good time. Over 14,000 airplanes can be accommodated at Oshkosh Airport at one time. But once you land, plan on waiting in line for 30 minutes to an hour before you're directed by EAA volunteers to your final tie-down spot. We're using something like 100 volunteers a day to make this operation work. And our job, primarily, once the airplane rolls off the runway, it's our job to find a place for them. Almost all parking for visiting aircraft is in the grass, and the EAA has a policy that all aircraft must be tied down. So be sure to bring ropes and tie down hardware for your airplane. Once you're on the ground and tied down, there's plenty to see and do here at Oshkosh.
20, about 21 controllers get selected for this event, and there are usually over 250 bidders that apply. I would have to say that uh, the controllers that are selected are probably the cream of the crop. They're the best at their facilities, and uh, they're getting selected to come to this event as an award. Usually, uh, controllers will try to pull off any method possible to come here, from uh, begging to uh, coercion to whatever might work. Since this is my first year, I am uh, profoundly affected by the uh, skill level of these controllers here. Fortunately, the rookies like me are paired up with two other veteran controllers and have their assistance uh, throughout the convention. I had no idea this was going to be as hard as it is. I thought it would be something with just a little practice and a little familiarity, a little studying of the local area that I could fall right into because I can talk fast. And I thought that was the key. However, it's just not. These people are... Uh, they're great. I'm very impressed. I'm having a great time with them. I'm learning a lot, and I'm hoping that I can take home some of that skill level back to my facility, and it'll be of use to me there. Basically, what you have here is you have a, a, a clearance delivery and flight data position. Uh, that's kind of like the clerical control job of air traffic control. They disseminate weather, take care of the ATISs, uh, coordinate with uh, Chicago Center on the inbound and outbound IFRs. The next position would be the ground control position. And uh, although most of the ground control work here takes place on the airport proper with controllers and control paddles, uh, our ground controller here still has to do a fair amount of coordinating for the multiple runway operation that we have regarding his taxing traffic. The uh, heart of the tower operation is the uh, local control positions, or, or as pilots know it, the tower position. And uh, it's the job of the tower controllers to be able to accommodate all of this traffic that has been lined up by the VFR approach control that we have and sequence them for the available runways at any given time. Uh, the air traffic controllers uh, at Oshkosh is all, have always been very professional. I think they handle the traffic uh, in a very uh, firm yet permissive manner that uh, they don't try to embarrass anybody and uh, I think the greatest testimony is just the safety record here at Oshkosh. I get Sport Aviation and I reviewed that and talked to several pilots that uh, that we met here that uh, I work with and they have flown here, uh, um, it must have been five or six times at least, and uh, they pretty much briefed me on the procedures and things to do and not to do. A lot of pilots cannot imagine uh, not using call numbers and uh, you know aircraft registration numbers, uh, just using the color of an airplane, the type and so whatever and uh, they can't imagine that at all and, and you try to explain it to them they think you're you're joking certainly the controllers on this end are, are, are very experienced at what they were doing and if the arriving pilots were aware of the procedure there's certainly no better way and no safer way to get the aircraft in this place the arrival and departure situation at Oshkosh usually is handled fairly well right now this is uh, the opening weekend so we're catering to arriving airplanes. That's what we're working mostly. Up through uh, probably Sunday night, we won't have a whole lot of departures because the people that are arriving now will probably want to stay for the full weekend. On Sunday evening, what we do is we then cater to the departures and we'll close the airport to arrivals for up to about a two hour period after the air show ends and we'll launch thousands of airplanes uh, during that segment of time. Sunday night departures make quite a line of waiting aircraft, but ATC uses two runways and a taxiway for rapid simultaneous release of traffic. It's an efficient operation. This has been one of the busiest Oshkosh fly-ins ever, and yet it has enjoyed one of the smoothest traffic flows in recent memory. We deeply respect the people in air traffic control, and we hope that the insights that this feature may have given you will make your next visit to Oshkosh both safer and more enjoyable. This is Dave Jackson at Oshkosh. I've been a fan of obtaining aviation weather through a personal computer as long as the technology has existed. You get a complete briefing as a pilot from the same sources used by Flight Service, the National Weather Service, and the FAA Weather. The fact is, you get all the stations along the route you want, not just what the briefer has time to give you on the telephone. Not to mention the fact, of course, that you don't have to wait on the telephone until the briefer has time to give you that weather information. Many of these services are very, very nice. I've used WSI, Aviotex, and lately CompuServe, mainly because of cost. 
and price of the service based on number of hours used, number of minutes used. Well, at Oshkosh, during the last EAA convention, I found a service I'd like to share with you. Pan American Weather Systems is affiliated with Pan American World Airways, and they're now marketing to fixed-based operators a weather service that is satellite-delivered. Most important to us pilots who frequent those FBOs who install the Pan Am system is we can access it from our personal computers free. We're at Aero Services at the south end of Teterboro Airport in New Jersey, the first FBO to install the Pan Am system, which includes a four-foot satellite dish on the roof of their building. Data from the satellite dish is continuously fed to a decoder box and then into this fairly normal PC setup, including a printer. No fancy credit card machines that don't work half the time or complicated keyboard structure. As a matter of fact, to illustrate, let me set up a flight from Teterboro to Washington National. After hitting the enter key, it instantly accesses the hard disk for all the weather information. This is a complete and legal weather briefing, including all the hourly sequence reports 50 miles each side of your route of flight. Now, compare the time it takes to receive this to the wait on the telephone, and then the much more abbreviated briefing from the flight service station. And then once it's received, there's no time charges incurred in scrolling through it on a page-by-page -page basis or by printing it out and taking it along with you in the aircraft. Those of you familiar with weather maps off of telephone-based systems will really appreciate Pan Am Weather Systems maps, and I'd like to show you four of them. This is where the speed of satellite delivery really takes effect. This is a radar summary for the entire United States, and note there's quite a bit of activity in the central and eastern portion of the United States. You can zoom in on any particular quadrant just by touching the cursor keypad, including centering the United States, and then fine-tuning the particular area that you want to look at or zoom in to read the fine detail on the map. There's a United States weather depiction map that also can be zoomed in on and put in various quadrants, just as we did with the radar map. And then, for those who want to look ahead, let's take a look at the 12 and 24 hour prog charts. Invert the color, just like we find them hanging on the wall at the flight service station, and here's a look at 12 hours ahead on the significant weather prog chart or the surface prog chart. The same thing for 24 hours ahead, significant weather, and surface prog. And if we really want to take a look ahead at the surface prog chart, here's the 36-hour look. Just like the en route briefing, any of these maps can be printed for further study or use in the cockpit. Now, all that we've just seen has taken place at the FBO. What if you want access to this data at home? With a laptop or tabletop PC and a modem, you can call your local Pan Am Weather Systems FBO and download the same kind of weather information that we just displayed. This weather map was done in that manner. Obviously, using a telephone line and modem at home, there's no way to duplicate the speed you saw demonstrated at the FBO. But I personally found that this method was as fast or faster than existing weather services. Now, those weather services have much more sophisticated flight planning programs. So, no matter which way you decide to go, the Pan Am Weather Service offers you a no-cost way to sample the exciting world of computerized pilot weather briefings. Pilots, get out your goggles and white scarves as you travel back in aviation history at old Rhinebeck Aerodrome in Rhinebeck, New York. For the price of admission, $6 for adults and $3 for children, it's a full day of fun and excitement for the whole family. Great care has been taken by Cole Palin, founder, curator, and pilot, to recreate a 1911 aerodrome. There are antique aircraft, cars, and motorcycles. Air show days are every Saturday and Sunday. You can see rare original aircraft performing aerial maneuvers, early 1900s style. See a mock World War I bombing raid on a German town. See World War I dogfights. For $20, you can personally experience the thrill of aviation by taking a flight in an original 1928 standard mail wing. Before and after the air show, plan on visiting the museum, which is adjacent to the field. 
In the museum, you'll find dozens of rare and unusual vintage motorcycles, cars, and aircraft, many of which are one of a kind. Some have been used in the air show in previous years, while others are awaiting restoration to be used in future shows. Call ahead to ensure that the shows will be held. The telephone number is 914-758-8610. You can fly into Rhinebeck Aerodrome, but you must arrive before 12 noon on the show days. Be sure, however, that you brush up on your short field and soft field technique, as the north-south turf runway is 2,200 feet long, made up of rolling hills with trees at both ends. The elevation of the field is 325 feet MSL. The airport opens again at 5 o'clock on show days. As an alternate, you can fly into Sky Park Airport in Red Hook, New York, which is located three miles northeast of Rhinebeck. The runway is 119, 2,666 feet long, paved but bumpy. Loose gravel can be found on the taxiways. The elevation of the field is 320 feet MSL. You will be charged for parking. Call ahead to ensure that a taxi is available for the trip to Rhinebeck. On what headings will a magnetic compass read most accurately during a level 360 degree turn with approximately 15 degrees of bank? 135 and 225 degrees? 180 and 0 degrees? Or 90 and 270 degrees? At 90 and 270 degrees, there is no northerly turning error. The Aircraft Owners and Pilots Association was founded in 1939 to lobby for general aviation and to promote the safety and interests of pilots. The organization has grown to over 260,000 active members with its headquarters in Frederick, Maryland, just outside Washington, D.C. We thought you would enjoy an inside look at AOPA headquarters to get a better idea of how AOPA serves general aviation today. Through the years, one of the most important uh, services your association performs is representing the interests of general aviation pilot before the Congress, the government agencies, and the state legislatures. Uh, it's an area we spend a tremendous amount of time on, uh, an area where we have problems with, with regularity. Some of the pressing problems currently have to do with the access to airspace, proper utilization of our tax money at the federal level, uh, an ominous attempt at the federal level now to regulate through legislation. We at AOPA spend a tremendous amount of time on these issues. John, we're very concerned about the uh, impact on the members of the new proposals in the 32 major terminal areas. In addition to working with lawmakers, AOPA often takes its message right to the public. We're going to go out and do a big education campaign, and we're going to try to get the public to understand that uh, general aviation just isn't the problem right now. All of the airport AOPA also educates people in the news media to understand aviation better and provide more accurate, more fair reporting. We seem to have as... Uh... AOPA. Another important facet of AOPA is the services it provides to individual members, services which are just a phone call away. ATIS frequency is 1210. Tower is 1184. Besides its lobbying efforts and services to members, AOPA is vitally involved in training and communications to improve the safety and enjoyment of flying. And through the Air Safety Foundation, AOPA reaches tens of thousands of pilots every year with its critical message of pilot proficiency and knowledge. For its members, one of the most enjoyable benefits of AOPA is Pilot Magazine. Pilot Magazine uh, is a real benefit to members because it is tailored for the membership. In other words, this is a membership magazine. We're responsible to the membership, and that membership is a diverse group. They fly everything from corporate jets down to simple single-engine airplanes, and we have to tailor the content of the magazine to address that wide range of interests. Uh, we have uh, a responsibility to give them operational advice, such as the metro complexity information that we're publishing on the uh, Dallas-Fort Worth area, but the principal job of the magazine is to provide the kind of operational information that is simply not available in any other publication. Why can we offer this? Because the readership is pre-qualified. They already fly, they're serious pilots, they voted with their wallets, they're members, and they're active pilots. 
So we assume in our editorial tone a level of knowledge that other magazines don't. And that enables us to go one step beyond and provide the kind of hard information that's hard to find in other publications. A lot of us remember when flying was just that, simply flying. Unfortunately, it's become far more complex. We're all concerned about liability, about taxes, about costs, uh, and we're obviously all concerned about safety. We want to reassure you that AOPA is here day in, day out, fighting the battles to ensure that you and I can still do what we love most, simply fly. And if you happen to get in the Frederick area, please come by the airport and see us, uh, those of us at the association representing your interests. We're at Van Nuys Airport in Southern California, and our reason for being here is to help fulfill a fantasy, a fantasy for you and one for me too. What we're going to do is go flying in a brand new Model 35A Learjet. The goal is to emphasize the difference between flying a jet-powered airplane and flying a piston-powered airplane. Of course, we can't go into all the details. We can't show you everything. But I'm going to give you more than the usual amount of detail by dividing this into a two-part feature. In this issue, I'll be giving you a walk around pre-flight inspection. Then we'll get into the cockpit and familiarize ourselves with some of the Learjet's instrumentation and cockpit features. And then we'll have some fun in the next issue of the Wide World of Flying. We'll then start the engines, taxi out, take off, and climb to altitude. We'll do some cruise flying, high altitude maneuvering, an emergency descent, and do some other fun things. But right now, let's get started with a pre-flight inspection. Whenever you pre-flight an airplane, any airplane, you have to have a starting point, and of course the Lear 35A is no exception. Usually start at the door, work forward and go clockwise around the airplane. What I'm going to do is show you the differences between a Lear 35A and a small single engine airplane. is the, the type you're probably accustomed to flying. I'm not going to point out all the idiosyncrasies, just the things that are a little different. For example, right over here is a vane which moves up and down. It's very similar to an angle of attack indicator, but it's not. It is part of the stall warning system. For example, at 7% above stall, what happens is this will activate a stick shaker and a stick nudger. It'll actually cause the control wheel to be nudged slightly forward. And if you persist in slowing the airplane, increasing the angle of attack, at one knot above stall, this will send a signal to the stick pusher, which now shoves the stick with a stronger force. It will insist that you don't stall, even though you may want to. Right below it, of course, is a pitot tube with uh, some static ports. Uh, this pitot tube services the captain's side or the left airspeed indicator. The tire, the nose wheel tire, is somewhat interesting. You'll notice it has a, an unusual shape to it. This is called a chined tire, and the purpose of this uh, shape is so that when taking off or landing in water, any water on the runway will be sprayed off to the side, and the splash from the tire won't go back into the engines and uh, perhaps cause them to flame out. Right up here, we have the anti-ice nozzle. Uh, what happens uh, during flight and icing conditions, hot bleed air from the engines is used and sprayed across this acrylic windshield to keep the windshields clear of ice. Pretty good system, works pretty well. This is an ice detection light, which as its name implies, is used to detect ice on the leading edge of the wing at night. This light is focused on a dark circle on the leading edge of the wing. It makes the ice fairly easy to see at night. This is the best place to begin checking the engine. From right here, we have a really good view of the fan blades of the engine and also the cowling of the engine to make sure that there's no damage. Simply inspect it, make sure no cracks or or any foreign objects are inside the engine itself. The leading edge of the wing is bare polished aluminum. And the reason it's not painted is that this section of the wing is heated with hot uh, bleed air from the compressor section of the engines. So when flying in icing conditions, actually this part of the wing gets fairly warm. This is a stall fence. It prevents a stall from propagating spanwise along the wing. It tries to confine, confine the stall to the inboard section of the wing. Well, I don't suppose there's any need to describe what this is. It's one very large fuel tank. 
There are actually five fuel tanks on a Learjet Model 35A. There are two large wingtip tanks. There are wing tanks within the wing itself, and there's a small fuselage tank uh, just aft of the passenger cabin. Altogether, the airplane holds 6,200 pounds of fuel, a little less than 1,000 gallons, enough to take the airplane safely from Honolulu to San Francisco and keep those 3,500-pound thrust Garrett engines from getting too thirsty. One interesting thing about the fuel is that it's kerosene, of course, jet fuel, and it's heavier than avgas. As you know, avgas weighs six pounds a gallon. Uh, kerosene, on the average, weighs about 6.7 pounds per gallon. These, of course, are conventional static wicks. And I'm sure you'll recognize this as a conventional home-brewed aileron. But there is one exception, one uniqueness to this aileron. Notice that as the aileron goes down, this balance tab goes up. And as the aileron rises, the balance tab goes down. This makes it a lot easier to control the roll rate of the Learjet. It makes the roll control very sensitive and is partly responsible for making a Learjet feel like a jet fighter. It's very easy to roll and a lot of fun, too. These devices along the top of the wing are called boundary layer energizers. Normally, at high speed, the air flowing over a wing tends to separate and ride high above the aileron. Now, if this were allowed to happen, the aileron wouldn't be very effective because you want the air to hug along the top surface of the aileron. These energizers, as you can see, there are three rows of them, create a little turbulence in the boundary layer. And this turbulence then tends to hug very closely the top surface of the wing, makes the aileron a lot more effective. The flaps are semi-fowler. You'll see they go aft before they start going down. This increases the area of the wing and, of course, increases the camber of the wing as well. Immediately ahead of the flaps are the spoilers. And on a Learjet, they serve two purposes. They are, of course, spoilers in the sense that when they are raised, they spoil much of the lift above the wing. It helps the Learjet to go down and slow down at the same time. But they also serve another purpose. When the flaps are extended more than 20 degrees, the spoilers act differentially in conjunction with the ailerons. What this means is that, for example, when you turn the control wheel to the right and you want the right wing to go down, this right spoiler will also rise to help kill the lift on the right wing, to help the roll toward the right. At the same time, the spoiler on the left side of the airplane remains flush. Conversely, when we roll the airplane to the left, the spoiler on the left wing goes up and this spoiler remains down. I'd like you to see what they look like, but these spoilers will only operate with an engine running. So if you don't mind, I'm going to stand back a little bit. Uh, we'll get an engine started, deploy the spoilers, and then you can see what they look like. Checking the oil level on a jet engine really isn't much different than checking the oil level on a conventional piston engine. Ah, uh, but it's not nearly as messy, thankfully. You don't have to take off an oil cap. You don't have to pull out a drippy, messy dipstick. All you have to do is look at this sight gauge, and that'll tell you exactly how much oil is in the engine. And there's one thing that'll blow your mind. You'd expect a big engine, such a powerful engine, to have a lot of oil. Well, it only has a capacity of five quarts no more than a 100 horsepower engine in a Cessna 150. And the reason that it doesn't need any more oil is the fact that there really aren't very many moving parts. And oil isn't used to cool a jet engine the way it does a piston engine. This, of course, is the thrust reverser system. When these clamshell doors are deployed in this position, jet exhaust coming out the back of the engine is forced to deflect downward and somewhat forward. This results in aerodynamic braking. It helps to slow the airplane down and helps to save on the brakes as well. There's nothing very exotic about a Learjet rudder. As a matter of fact, it's conventional in almost every respect. In fact, here's something you might find of interest. The rudder 
the elevator and both ailerons are operated manually with cables and push tubes, just like all other general aviation airplanes. A thorough pre-flight inspection should also include looking up the tailpipe of the engine, making sure that the turbine blades are in good condition, that there's no damage of any kind that's apparent to the naked eye, and there are no foreign objects lying in there like a pair of pliers that some mechanic might have laid down. There's not much difference, of course, between this side of the airplane and the other, but there is one item that I failed to point out to you. This is a fuel jettison nozzle. And it allows the pilot to uh, dump fuel. He can lose uh, 1,200 pounds of fuel from each tip tank by gravity. It takes about two minutes. Well, the pre-flight is just about done. And uh, the best part about that is we get to go in the cockpit and see what that looks like. As we sit here in the cockpit of a Lear 35A, you can see that there are a lot of gadgets up here. It'll be impossible to cover all of them. So what we're going to try to do is to cover all of those items that make flying a Learjet different than flying, for example, a Cessna 172. For example, let's start with the upper panel. You'll see a row of enunciation lights. This is the master warning system. Red lights are warnings, yellow lights are cautions, and there are a few green lights which are simply advisory in nature. Above the uh, enunciator lights is the thrust reverser arming uh, system. These switches have to be turned on to arm the thrust reversers prior to landing. By pulling the switches down, we simply test the electrical integrity of the arming system. And below the enunciator lights are simply the uh, pitch and roll mode controls for the autopilot and flight director systems. To the left and right of the autopilot mode control panel are the uh, fire pull handles. A fire in an engine is indicated by uh, the lights flashing in the appropriate handle. Now in case we do have an engine fire, all that is necessary is to pull this fire pull out. And what that does, it shuts off the fuel supply to the engine, it shuts off the uh, hydraulics from the engine, shuts off the bleed air from the engine, and it also arms two fire extinguishing bottles. And if the fire doesn't go out, simply by pulling the fire pull handle, we then can discharge one or both uh, fire extinguisher bottles. Now let's take a look at the captain's flight instruments. Uh, starting over here in the extreme left-hand corner, we have the uh, anti-skid uh, warning lights in the event that one of the anti-skid systems, and there's one for each of the four main wheels, in the event an anti-skid system fails, a uh, red light will come on. The yellow light indicates, of course, that the parking brake is set. This small little gauge below the DME indicator is a uh, gauge used to help synchronize the engines because just like on any multi-engine airplane, if the jet engines are not synchronized, you'll hear a beat which can be uh, unnerving in flight. So this little gauge tells us whether the right engine is going slower or faster than the left engine and by making small throttle adjustments, we can keep the engines in sync. The airspeed indicator is somewhat unconventional. In addition to displaying indicated airspeed, it also shows us the Mach speed of the aircraft. Uh, Mach 0.83, which is 83% of the speed of sound, for example, is the maximum allowable Mach speed of this airplane. Right here is the conventional attitude indicator. Nothing unusual about that. This is an electronic flight instrument system representation of an HSI, or a horizontal situation indicator. And it can give us a lot of different kinds of information, and we'll come back to that uh, in a little bit. Over here is a battery-powered standby attitude indicator. In the event of a total electrical failure, this battery-powered indicator could be used as a backup. Let's turn our attention now to the center instrument panel to the right of the captain's flight gauges. The first uh, gauges I'd like to talk about are the primary power gauges for the left and right engines. This left row is for the left engine, and this right row of instruments is for the right engine. The first gauge at the very top indicates the percentage of turbine RPM that is uh, being developed by the engine. For example, if the gauge indicates six, that means that the turbine of the right engine, in this case, is turning at 60% of its maximum allowable RPM. It's important to understand that this is not percentage of power, 
but percentage of maximum allowable RPM. Down here are the gauges which indicate the percentage of allowable RPM being developed by the first stage of compression or the fan blades. These are the blades that we saw when we uh, looked inside the front of the engine during the pre-flight inspection. Between the turbine and fan RPM gauges are the interstage turbine temperature gauges, which are sort of like EGT gauges on a conventional piston engine. Uh, it, these show the temperature of exhaust passing through the turbine sections of the engines. Observing temperature limits is absolutely necessary to prolong engine life. Above and to the right is the ram air temperature gauge. And this is the temperature of the air outside the aircraft as sensed by the aircraft. And that's different than the ambient temperature outside the aircraft. Because as you fly along at, let's say, 80% of the speed of sound, the air impacting against the airplane becomes compressed and heats up. So this ram air temperature will be about 20 degrees warmer than the actual ambient temperature outside the aircraft, at least during cruise speed. Immediately below the engine gauges is the uh, color radar. And I've just turned it on uh, and put it in the test pattern mode so uh, we can see what it looks like. Coming back up to the top of the center panel, we have a small little gauge which indicates the pressure of air in an emergency air bottle. And this air is stored under pressure to lower the landing gear if the gear doesn't lower conventionally. It also can be used to operate the brakes. To the right, over here, is the altitude alert system. We can set that to any altitude that we're cleared to. For example, if we're cleared to flight level 350, we set in 35,000 feet. And it has an oral warning to indicate when we're approaching our assigned altitude. And here's what the alert sounds like. Below the altitude alert system, is what is referred to as the N1 reminder gauge. Uh, before takeoff, we determine on the basis of uh, pressure altitude and outside air temperature uh, what the power setting will be for takeoff. And we use N1 as the main power gauge. N1 is the uh, speed of the fan section of the engine. So right now, uh, today, we'll be using at this uh, pressure altitude and temperature a fan speed of 95.4% for takeoff. And that's a reminder not to exceed 95.4% for takeoff. This allows us to test some of the warning systems. We'll turn the test switch to the mock position, turn on the stall warning system, which is necessary. And now, when I push this button, watch what happens to the control wheel. Because this senses the airplane going too fast, the yoke will automatically come back and raise the nose for us in the event we don't do it ourselves. Here we go. Watch. Let's see what happens when we test the stall warning system. You'll recall during the pre-flight, I indicated that when we get to within 7% of stall, we'll get a stick shaker and the yoke will nudge forward. Then when we get to within one knot, the, the yoke is shoved forward just like that. And that happened automatically. So the airplane will recover from a stall all by itself if we don't have the common sense to uh, recover before the airplane stalls or approaches a stall. To the left of the test function selector knob is an interesting sub-panel. For example, right here are switches that turn on the ignition for the left and the right engine. These are used only in flight to prevent a flame out, for example, uh, during turbulence encounters, uh, flying in heavy rain, or when the anti-ice system is turned on. Normally, uh, when the engines are operating in flight, the ignition systems are turned off because once you start the fire in a jet engine, it keeps on running. You don't need the ignition on to keep it running uh, as is necessary in a uh, piston-powered engine. Now let's get to the uh, best part of the airplane the go knobs or the throttles that control those jet engines. In reality, these aren't throttles. They're called thrust levers on a jet airplane. On the Learjet, when you advance the throttle just a little forward, like so, you heard the click, that feeds fuel to the engine. That's part of how you start the jet engine. Similarly, we push the right thrust lever forward into that detent, 
and that feeds fuel to the engine. Now the thrust levers or the throttles are in the idle position. These two knobs right here are the thrust reverser knobs so that once the throttles have been brought to the idle position and we wish to engage reverse thrust, we simply grab these two knobs and pull them aft. Now to shut the engine down, we do the reverse. We lift this little knob right here and pull the throttle aft. That shuts off the fuel supply to the engine. Same thing on the left throttle. And now the engines are shut down. That's all you have to do. This handle right here, of course, is the parking brake handle, and this lever operates the flaps. Right now, the flaps are in the eight degree position. If you wanted to raise the flaps, we simply move the lever up. Just below the thrust levers is the fuel gauge, uh, which can be selected to show the amount of fuel in each of the five tanks, or it can be selected to show the total amount of fuel on board. This red guarded switch is one switch you really don't want to move by mistake, because if you do, you'll dump all of the fuel in the tip tanks. A pair of switches on this control panel is used to turn the yaw dampers on and off. And the yaw dampers, of course, are used to automatically prevent the airplane from skidding and slipping, especially at altitude. And it also explains why the uh, rudder is never required when entering or recovering from a turn. Immediately below the yaw damper panel are the controls for the HSI. Uh, this knob right here simply controls the heading bug, moves it clockwise and counterclockwise to select a given heading. If, for example, air traffic control says maintain present heading and we want to slew the heading bug to the 12 o'clock position, all we have to do is push that button and the heading bug automatically goes to the 12 o'clock position. This knob to the right is the uh, course selector for the course deviation indicator of the VOR receiver. And we can select any course we'd like. There's one nice feature about this. If we want to center the needle immediately, just center the needle, all we have to do is push down on the top of that button the needle automatically turns and slews to the centered position and we know exactly what radial we're on and what course we have to maintain to keep the needle centered. These uh, switches in the center of the HSI control panel uh, select different functions on the HSI. For example, in the HSI position we see the entire uh, HSI, a 360 degree directional indicator. However, if we only wish to use the top part of the direction indicator, that is the uh, top arc on the compass, all we have to do is hit the arc button, and then we only see about 45 degrees either side of the heading we're on. This allows us to see an expanded scale, and we can make very small heading changes, as little as one degree at a time. We can also select a map mode, and we can select other navigation modes which are a bit more involved. And that pretty much completes the uh, cockpit review of the Lear 35A. And uh, after you do that, I suppose it's time to go flying. In the next issue of the Wide World of Flying, we're gonna have a lot more fun. We're gonna fly this airplane. I'm looking forward to it and I hope you are too. See you then. Stay tuned now for Wide World of Flying's Bonus Buyer's Guide. But first, I'd like to thank Mr. and Mrs. Furs for their exciting home video on the Rhinebeck, New York Airport. And a reminder to you, if you have some home video shot by your camcorder that you'd like to share with us, send a letter describing it to Peregrine Productions, 6910 Havenhurst Avenue, Suite 106, Van Nuys, California, 91406. Maybe your video will be in our video letters to the editor column. In our next issue, Barry Schiff shows us how to fly the Lear 35, and we'll have a very unique story from the Reno Air Races. Until then, from all of us at ABC's Wide World of Flying, thanks and good flying. Man was not born with an internal navigation system. Has he always followed geese, the sun and the stars, and made stick marks in the sand? Maps are as old as thought, and thought is as old as man. 
From the beginning, he has recorded his discoveries and exploits and charted his legends with geographical surrounds. He developed a system of navigation, not so much to know where he was going, but rather to remember where he had been. For how else could he return to the treasures and pleasures he had found? One of the most accurate navigational devices to be developed was the Loran system. A fisherman could drop a lobster pot 15 miles offshore. By simply noting the latitude and longitude, he could return to that very same spot and get his catch. Today's Loran enables you to fly to your destination without the restrictions imposed by inflexible VOR airway structures. You now have the ability to know at any time where you are, relative to your destination or to any airport, VOR, NDB, or intersection. Digital Marine Electronics Corporation, our parent company, made its reputation in the Marine Loran trade. We have been improving Lorans for over 17 years. For the past nine years, the National Marine Electronics Association has offered a coveted award for performance and reliability. We have won it all nine times. Now, with our experience and expertise, we have developed the North Star Navigation Management System. Far more than just a Loran, this black box outthinks, outperforms, and outmaneuvers its competition. North Star Avionics. The North Star has superior range, the largest database, the brightest display, and most important of all, it is the only Loran that has independent readouts. It's really easy to operate and speaks a language you understand. The North Star's receiver is recognized as the most powerful and accurate. For capacity, our database contains over 20,000 locations. Not only airports, but all VORs, NDBs, and low-level intersections over twice as many locations as any other Loran ever built. And the North Star doesn't limit you to the United States. It knows its way around Canada, Mexico, and the Bahamas. Wherever you're flying, simply dial up the airport name. If you can't remember it, the city name will do just as well. The North Star will not only navigate you there, it also knows the airport's elevation, its runway lengths, direction, and surfaces of up to five runways, its latitude, longitude, ATIS, approach, tower, ground, and even Unicom frequencies. No other Loran made today knows all this. The North Star's database is a comprehensive encyclopedia of aviation navigation information. Of course, we're fully updatable. Our Loran is unique. You can watch your distance and location on one side while working its numerous capabilities on the other simultaneously. We at North Star have always felt that a Loran navigational device was not enough for aero navigation. Our Loran was designed by pilots, for pilots. A Loran system that can answer your questions as fast as you can think them while still functioning as a basic Loran. The North Star Navigator is equipped with a data output which allows interfacing the set with visual display systems, fuel computers, and ELTs. The North Star outperforms its competition in receiver sensitivity and is unique in its ability to operate effectively through the mid-continent gap. And yes, you can take the North Star home to program destination coordinates or just to play with it. Our quality control even surprised us, but was no accident. Our 36-month warranty is longer than any other Loran in its price range. This is the aging room. 
Here, our navigator spends the first five days of its functional life running continuously under varying temperatures and tests. For places lost, for places found, the North Star, it remembers. North Star, a multi-purpose, computer-controlled aero-navigational device, allows you to do what you like doing best, fly. Navigation with our North Star is that simple. Modern man, for business or for pleasure, has duplicated the goose. With the development of the Loran Sea, man has now surpassed the bird brain's instincts inexpensively. What you lack in instinct, the North Star makes up in memory. American 278, regional tower, runway 17 right, here for takeoff. American 278, contact departure, have a nice day. Regional departure, radar contact, verify altitude. 1,000 overcast, wind 010. Catch runway 1 right, departing runway 1 left. Aero evolution is knowing about geese and maps, Lorans and radials. Owning a North Star is experiencing it. We are North Star Avionics, the creators of the M1 navigation management system. During the first 30 years of operation, Piper Aircraft was under the direction and leadership of William T. Piper, a private individual with the hopes and dreams of what aviation had to offer. He molded and shaped the company in one of the general aviation industry's leading manufacturers. As the industry grew, aviation manufacturers became ripe for acquisition by corporate conglomerates. But the industry overbuilt and overexpanded and sales rates began falling. The corporate conglomerates found themselves answering to shareholders who were more concerned with return on investment than the continued development of aviation. Piper suffered along with others, but now it is back where it belongs, in the hands of an aviator and a businessman. When I purchased Piper Aircraft Corporation, there was talk that the former owners were suspending production and shutting the company down. That is not my plan at all. Vero Beach, Florida, May 19, 1987. M. Stuart Millar, new owner of Piper, Piper Aircraft, Aircraft today, today announced the resumption of production of certain Piper Airplanes, which had previously today announced Piper Aircraft Corporation today announced a substantial price reduction in Piper Manufacturing's Piper Aircraft Corporation today announced the Piper Aircraft Corporation today announced the celebration of Cheyenne prop jets to be used by Alitalia and Lufthansa Airlines for the flight train. Piper Aircraft today announced factory direct sales of its Cheyenne prop jets. For 50 years, the name Piper has stood for honest, reliable airplane. The people of Piper are hardworking, dedicated people to a level of aircraft construction skill that can only be gained through years of experience. With over 95,000 Piper aircraft providing dependable service around the world today, Piper is one of the great success stories in American history. I intend to see that heritage continue, unbroken, far into the future. As an aircraft owner, one of my greatest concerns has been the spiraling cost of replacement parts. Therefore, I have substantially reduced the price of Piper manufactured spare parts. My goal is to make Piper parts affordable for all owners. In addition, I've expanded and will continue to expand our network of service distributors. I want to make it easier to own and operate a Piper aircraft. Quite simply, I plan to treat Piper owners as I have always wanted to be treated myself. For 50 years, Piper owners have loyally supported Piper. In recognition of that support, I have ordered a 20% reduction in the standard equipped price of a limited number of special edition piston aircraft. 
I have also announced that we will now sell Cheyenne aircraft directly from the factory. This will result in substantial savings on a Cheyenne 3A or Cheyenne 400. And I will be able to personally see that Cheyenne customers get the best care when purchasing their aircraft. I am in this business for the long haul. I can assure you that we will not only continue to produce the entire Piper line, but we are launching an aggressive new aircraft development program as well. Let me share with you my vision for the future of Piper Aircraft to restore Piper to its rightful place in the aviation community. I invite you to join me in the renaissance of Piper Aircraft. Hello, fellow pilots. I'm John King of King Schools. I'm going to share a tip with you from our new course, 101 Ways to Be a Better, Safer Pilot. This tip just could help keep you from walking the last few miles of your trip on some windy day. And I'm Martha King. I'm going to share a tip from the 101 Ways course that could help you avoid making dangerously flat approaches on a windy day. Most of us wonder from time to time whether our airplane has a built-in headwind. Well, you can quit wondering. Overall, it does. Here's why. First of all, over a round trip, any wind always slows you down. Assume you have a 100 knot airplane and are making a 200 nautical mile round trip, 100 nautical miles each way. Well, if there were no wind, the trip would take two hours. But now, let's assume a 50-knot tailwind on the way out and a 50-knot headwind on the way back. Well, on the way out, with a 50-knot tailwind, your ground speed will be 150 knots, and that leg will take 40 minutes. But on the return leg, with a 50-knot headwind, your ground speed is only 50 knots, and that leg will take two hours. The total round trip time will take two hours and 40 minutes because you spend longer flying into the headwind than you do flying with the benefit of the tailwind. Now, if the wind is 90 degrees off your course, it'll still slow you down. That's because some of the energy of your airplane is spent flying sideways to counter the effect of the wind. Even a wind that comes from slightly behind your aircraft will slow you down because of this effect. These ground speed arcs on the wind side of the computer demonstrate this by curving behind the airplane. Now, for a 100-knot airplane, any wind dot that falls in front of the 100-knot arc will decrease your ground speed. The stronger the wind and the slower your airplane, the more you'll be affected. So, if you're about to make a familiar round trip and any wind is forecast, it'd be a good idea to refigure your fuel needs. Otherwise, that built-in headwind just might cause you to walk those last few miles to the airport. A strong headwind on final could, if you're not careful, turn your normal approach into something resembling a low-level strafing run to the airport. Here's why. The FAA standard for the angle of descent on final approach is three degrees. Most visual approach slope indicators, VASIs, provide a three degree angle of descent. And so do most ILS glide slopes. In a familiar airplane, pilots usually know what rate of descent in feet per minute is required to maintain the standard glide path to the airport at the normal approach speed. Notice on this instrument approach chart that at 90 knots ground speed, your rate of descent should be just over 450 feet per minute. But a strong headwind on final will greatly reduce the rate of descent required for a normal glide path with a 20 knot headwind. This same airplane would only have a ground speed of 70 knots on final, and the correct rate of descent would be just over 350 feet per minute. 
with a strong headwind on final, maintaining the power setting and configuration for your usual rate of descent could cause you to become dangerously low, particularly if the airport does not have a VASI or a glide slope. Here's a quick rule of thumb that will help you avoid that predicament. To estimate the standard rate of descent in feet per minute, multiply your ground speed in knots by five. If, due to a strong headwind, your ground speed on final today is only 50 knots, then a 250 feet per minute rate of descent will give you the standard glide path and keep you from flying a low, flat approach. Keeping this rule of thumb stored in mind could help you avoid that low-level strafing run to the airport on some windy day. Whether you want to get up to date for a biennial flight review, pass a written test, or prepare for a check ride, it's all guaranteed. King Video Ground School trains you to understand the big picture by taking you on location, in the cockpit, in the weather, or in the tower. Monster graphics make difficult problems fall into place with ease. Private Pilot Magazine says the student who follows John King's lecture, graphics, and numerous sample problems will have an excellent understanding of the subject. Plane and Pilot News says our evaluation panel found the King Accelerated Ground School tapes, in their opinion, to be the best offered. Here's what students say. This is Patty Wagstaff and her Pits S1 special. I've taken two King Ground School courses. My sister's taken a couple and my husband's taken probably three or four and every one of them has been really successful and really fantastic. And we've all done great on them too. We've gotten really high scores and uh, can attribute it all to John and Martha and to King Accelerated Ground Schools. Hi, my name is Rick Gillette. I used the King home video course to obtain a 96 on my instrument instructor written exam. I couldn't have done it without King. I took the King Private Ground School course. I thought it was a very concise and thorough course, and it gave me everything I needed to pass the FAA written with a score of 88. It raised my level of confidency quite a bit. I did get a 92 on my private test, and I got a 98 on my IFR test, and I feel really, really proud. And I find that they're very easy to follow, and being able to rewind them and review makes it even more easy. The newest King course, 101 Ways to Be a Better, Safer Pilot, is a course every pilot will benefit from. You'll learn rules of thumb, how to predict local weather conditions, how to avoid being deceived by optical illusions in flight, how to avoid mechanical problems in flight, how to communicate on the radio with ease, and much, much more. The special introductory price is just $99 for four hours of practical learning. King VFR and IFR updater courses are a great way to prepare for a biennial flight review or just get current again. Each is $99 for four hours of informative video. King written exam courses include at least five two-hour videotapes, a course book, three practice exams with answers and detailed explanations, plus your exam sign-off. Exam courses for only $199 are instrument, commercial, flight instructor, instrument instructor, ATP, and flight engineer. The private course is only $149. King flight test courses show you how to ace your private, commercial, or IFR flight test. An actual FAA examiner tells what he expects of you, and your instructor shows you how to demonstrate your knowledge on the ground and in the air. Each course includes the practical test standards booklet and two videotapes for only $89. For same-day shipping, call 800-854-1001. You'll have a 20-day free trial, and if you fail your test, you keep the course and get your money back. Order within 30 days and mention ABC's Wide World of Flying, and we'll give you a bonus for promptness. The King Takeoff Course Album, a $60 value. Your bonus includes audio cassettes on mountain flying, weather flying, flying the high flying recips, and frightened spouses. To get your bonus for promptness and your King Course, call 800-854-1001 now. If you're viewing a borrowed copy of Wide World of Flying and would enjoy having your own subscription, or if you'd like to order a subscription as a very special gift for a pilot or aviation enthusiast, credit card holders may call us toll-free at 1-800-999-8783. Or you may send a personal check to our subscription center in Des Moines, Iowa. The price is just $99.95 for one full year. And if you'd like to join the Aircraft Owners and Pilots Association and receive all the benefits of being a member, plus Pilot Magazine every month, simply call their toll-free number, 1-800-USA-AOPA. 
They will be pleased to answer any questions you may have and will take membership information right over the phone.